Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. I am here with the one and only Dono. And we're going to do something we've been kind of not putting off for a couple years, but we keep missing the window to do it for a couple years. We're talking about dandelion wine. That's right. A fermented beverage made with dandelion. Not the whole dandelion, as we'll tell you about, but this is an amazing project to take on for home fermenters, utilizing something that is generally in your yard anyway. You might as well make something right. fun out of it. So we're going to walk you through the process, how to capture these dandelion heads, how to steep them, how to make a fermentable wort, I guess, if you want to call it Probably that. Probably a must. A must? This is a must. Right. Hey, -oh. hey. Fermentation all the way through enjoying it and a little bit of family history, if nothing else. So join us. We're going to taste through three mine and then two extreme vintages of Dono's. And uh, I think it's safe to say we're going to get a little lit on a Sunday afternoon here in St. Paul. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Is that what we say? <laughs> Before we begin the episode, a quick disclaimer. Dandelions are considered a weed. So if you do make dandelion wine, and we think you should, You'll want to pick dandelions from a yard, field, or an area that you know does not use pesticides. You can imagine why. Make sure your source is safe and keep it clean. We could do a video of this, but every time we think to do a video, by the time you do a video, now the rest of the country is out of dandelions. So we're, it's not even spring here. It's gray, cold, and dreary. But I know that other parts of the country are experiencing dandelion season. Um, that mixed with the excitement last week I presented at the Pacific Northwest Homebrewers Conference. Uh, I talked about about nine different eclectic beverages in this presentation, and this is the one that everybody clung to. We started Q and A, and all they want to know about was when do the raisins and when do the heads and this and this. So um, I feel like it's a, a fun episode to put out. We're going to talk about how Don has made it how I followed Don's lead into it, but I really wanted to start it super quick with a little bit of family history. So apparently my grandmother used to make dandelion wine, and there's this handwritten recipe card by my Uncle Tommy when he must have been 14. I just want to read it super quick, and this will give you kind of an idea that the process really hasn't changed a whole lot, maybe just the refinement. So, five quarts dandelion, five gallon boiling water over dandelions, let stand two hours. Strain, let stand until lukewarm. Mix together the following, six oranges, 15 pounds of sugar, five lemons, two and a half pounds of raisins, two and a half cakes of yeast, add to lukewarm water, cover and stir twice a day for eight to nine days. Strain through cloth, strain through cloth. I don't know if they literally did it twice or if Tommy was just caught up in the moment. Put in jars with loose corks, store for two weeks, then strain again. Time to get drunk. P.S. Have fun partying. Uncle Tom. So the point here is that sounds a lot like what we're about to tell you we did. Um, one funny footnote to that story. So my grandma says that they would do this in a large crock, five gallons obviously, but they would put in the whole fruit, either wedged or kind of quartered. And at the end of this eight or nine day ferment, when they got together as a group of ladies to bottle it, they would like eat the fruit along the way. So lemon, orange. And she tells the story that they got a little bit too schnockered, I think maybe is the word she used, uh, one night where she had to like walk a friend home and that woman had to cancel a Boy Scout meeting due to the power of the uh, inoculated fruit. Country wines. <laughs> I know. So with that kind of setup about the basics, um, tell me a bit about why you did this and, and who you turned to for information the first time you wanted to do it. This was in 2007, so I had been brewing beer for about six years at this point. I probably had done some experimenting. I'd made a, probably a couple meads by that point, and it was something I'd heard about, and I don't do a lot of yard care, so I have dandelions, and I thought, <laughs> I wonder about this dandelion wine that I've heard about. I did not have a family history myself that I was aware of. Oh. I did find out later that my grandmother also used to do it. Okay. But it wasn't like this thing that I was even aware of. But I just went to the internet and did a lot of research and what I found is there were any number of ways. 
Um, they had the use of dandelion flowers, use of some kind of sugar because you don't get any fermentable products from the flowers, right. unlike when you do mead or if you're picking fruit and fermenting it, you get sugar out of that. But here you have to use sugar to get the ferment fermentable. But I, I just did a lot of reading and I, let's say I found like four recipes or approaches that I kind of liked and I had done enough brewing by then that I thought, okay, I like the idea of uh, steeping this. I, I don't like the idea of, you know, this process. And I just took um, also the range. So you said she had 15 pounds of sugar. Mm -hmm. So that's three pounds per gallon. Right. And I came up with the ratio of 2.5 pounds per gallon. So that ratio is a little higher, but yep. again, there's, there's just a range. So I just put together a recipe that I thought looked like it um, suited my, my, um, preferences. Before we get into them, you can find both of Don's recipes at his website, which we will put in a handy dandy lower third right here. And we'll also include them in the uh, episode description. So um, yeah, tell us kind of the basics for 2007 and what you learned from it and what changed to 2008. So what you're going to need is a good supply of dandelions. <laughs> now, um, you'll see some pictures here, but you're going to want them when I believe whenever I think whenever they're going to be most open and biggest, which yeah. is um, probably when the sun is out, I'm guessing maybe a certain time of day. And what I found is I originally went to a park that I knew there was just tons and tons of flowers. But then when I ended up picking them all, I was really in like a, a 10 by 10 area in the park and I had all that I needed. So yeah. I found I, you can get plenty of flowers probably just in a smaller area. But what you do is you're going to grab the flower and you're going to cut the right below the yellow part. Essentially, you want the yellow part only. You can get some of the green that's on the bottom side of it. Yep. You don't want the stem, you don't want the leaves. So I would just, I had a scissors and I would just kind of pull it up and clip it. Yep. And I would just be putting them into a, maybe a quart jar because that's kind of how you measure it is by volume. <laughs> a quart jar of uh, dandelion heads is what you're going to be going for. My original recipe that I came up with was two to three quarts of dandelion flowers per gallon. Meaning that you jars want to make. stuffed with yellow Not flowers. packed in there, but right. yeah, just kind of I mean, set in there. Yes. A quart jar of yellow flowers. And to reiterate, you do not, if anything, you do not want the stem or that little, I don't know what the scientific name is, but it's basically that little like node. Yeah, there's a green. That knuckle, that thing is full of the bitterest, nasty, milky substance I know yeah. from getting it on my hands. And yeah, I think a little bit of that. it, I you'll see it from my pictures. And chips pictures, you'll see what you come up with. I don't think you have to overly worry about it if you just want to get as much of the yellow stuff as you can. And if they're, you know, bigger, then you're going to fill up that quart jar faster. I did a two to three quarts was my ratio. I ended up using a, a, exactly 2.5 quarts per gallon the first time I made it. Because I made two gallons and I used five quart jars of Dandelion heads. Then what you do is you get your water. So um, I used about 1.5 gallons of water. My goal original volume, total volume was two gallons. So I used one and a half gallons of water. I put the flowers in there as your grandmother talks about mm -hmm. and as all the recipes I talked about, they zest oranges and lemons. There may be other, there'd be no reason you couldn't do other citrus fruits. You could yeah. probably do grapefruit, lime, whatever you kind of wanted, but oranges and lemons are common. My ratio was one lemon, the zest and the juice, and two oranges, the zest and the juice, and that's per gallon. So I put the zest into the water with the dandelion flowers, and I brought it to a boil. And I simmered the boil for 10 minutes. Near the end of the boil, that's when I added the juice from the fruit. I don't think I put the fruit in. I just uh, would have squeezed all the juice out. And the first time I made it, which is this, 2007, I let it sit like that for five hours. Now, you, what was your grandma's time? She said for two hours, strain and let stand at lukewarm. So, but the, the contact time, what I'm yeah, getting at is, two hours. this is the range too. The contact time with the dandelion flowers is flexible. Yeah. She said two hours, I did five hours. 
the first day. The second year, I did two days. Yeah. So. I took your cue. I think we did a full day. I think we did overnight. So the steeping, what you're going for mainly, you're getting some flavor, but you're also, you're trying to extract color. You're getting color and flavor. And this is the only time that you're actually using the dandelions in the whole process. Yeah. It's just this original time. It's kind of like a tea, yep. essentially. So after it sits for however long, then you're going to separate the flowers and I guess the zest out of the, the, the must. When I did it the first time, I started off with 1.5 gallons of water. At this point, I had 1.2 gallons of water. Then I dissolved five pounds of sugar in the still warm water, and that brought the volume, interestingly enough, up to 1.9 gallons is what I wrote down. A lot yeah. of times when you add sugar, it doesn't really increase the volume, but maybe yeah. that was like enough sugar yeah. in that situation. Top. I did top it off to around two gallons, and it cooled down to about 80, and then I pitched the yeast. So this all would have been on day one is when I did it the first time. I pitched the yeast. I use 71B Narbonne yeast. Um, you're going to want to use some kind of a yeast that has a somewhat of a high alcohol tolerance if you are going to be aiming for this level of original gravity, which is can be 1100 or higher if you're using this much sugar that we're talking about. Your grandma's would have been even higher at three pounds per gallon. That would have been even higher original gravity. Boy Scout meeting cancellation worthy. So it has the fruit zest, it has the fruit juice, it has all the sugar, and it ferments. How, how much yeast you add, how your fermentation goes, the timing of, of, all, of their next step is going to probably vary. Yeah. But most of the, many of the recipes that I read, and this was a thing that I chose that I wanted to do, is I wanted to use golden raisins to give it some flavor, but also some body. Yeah. And of course, sweetness as well. So at the end, near the end of the fermentation, I had two pounds of golden raisins. I you cut them off them up to kind to of, kind of break them. the skin. And I put them into this, the, at this point it's wine because it's uh, been, been fermenting. And I put them in there. But a week after I did it, I, it had been fermenting yeah. for about a week. I did the raisins. At the tail end of fermentation. Yeah. And then in your second one, you did like I did and racked you basically racked onto raisins as a secondary fermentation. Well, or I probably raisins. just, I probably just, you, did you rack them onto the raisins? Mm -hmm. I think I just dumped them into my primary, but then at some point, oh. I mean, I don't have all of, I do. I just yeah. made a note, racked a couple times to le keep leaving sediment behind, because that's something with these country wines that you'll see is they'll, you know, they'll get clearer and they'll have sediment and then you can rack again and you're, you may want to do that a couple of times. But then I, I I left it for eight months before I bottled it. On the raisins? No. Off? No. Okay. I'm not, I don't know if I have a record of how long it okay. was on the raisins, but I would probably say a We should reiterate or here that there's, you could put raisins in, you could probably do it in primary. I've explored so much more with fruit in primary. You could do it at the end, almost like a, some people dry hop near terminal gravity versus mm -hmm. dry hopping after. There's just... There's really no way of doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's got so much booze that I'm not too worried about contamination. And this one, the 2007 one, didn't ferment that low. So I added, ended up adding more yeast to try to get it down even more. It only got down to like in the upper 1030s. And then I didn't have to back sweeten it because it was still very sweet. Go to the next year I did it. I had a much better fermentation. Everything was pretty much the same. I did a slightly smaller volume, but I went for about the same gravity. I did change one key thing, and that's kind of interesting if the, I don't think the color is, it's a little bit lighter, but that probably yeah. has to do with this has maybe more residual sugar in it. But the, so we talked about leaving it for five hours in the hot steep with mm -hmm. the um, dandelions. I left it the second year for two days because that's another thing that I was reading about. That can vary greatly with how much you leave it. And I wasn't really sure how much dandelion character I was getting, and I just wanted to know if I could get more dandelion character. So let's go ahead and take yeah. a sip of the 2008 and see if... And this is the one that Elsa thought tasted the most dandelion-like. It is floral. And maybe it does have a little bit more of something that's... Mm -hmm. um, possibly from the, the the flowers. I mean, with your two, I just can't... Um, 
I can't not admit how much like mead they kind of taste yep. in body, yeah, in sweetness, in aftertaste. I think even. that's probably a combination of the sugar and the raisins, which have also sugar, but mm -hmm. they give it a, a body. Yep. Now this one, so the second year I had a much better fermentation. That got down to 10, 12. That went all the way down. That probably is more like 14% alcohol. I may have maxed out the um, alcohol tolerance of that yeast strain. And this one, now that I did a little back and forth, this one's definitely more warming on the back of the throat. There's more alcohol in there. It's, I, I don't know if one is, is better than the other one. Um, I was more happy with this fermentation hmm, yeah, for well, whatever reason. I really don't know why. I think maybe I put more yeast in right away or more than one packet right away instead of trying to get a, a stalled fermentation going. Okay. So that may have been a, a help of that. But I did, the, it's it's all the similar process. I did, I think I didn't add the raisins to this one until it was basically done fermenting. Which is what I did. Basically a secondary fermentation addition. Like you would rack onto fruit or something. Sure. So basically, I mean, that is it in a nutshell. When you read these country wine recipes for any sort of different fruit wine, dandelion wine, you will often see that they say, wait a year before bottling, wait a year before drinking. That's just some interesting arbitrary amount of time that they yeah. put in there. But well, it's here just, we are, yeah. 10 years, this one will be 10 years old in uh now a couple months oh, yeah i, I mean, see what you're saying yeah the day. 2007 okay. to 2017 and it drinks totally fine i mean there's no that's not even like oxidized or anything it's it just really not. tastes just fine so you you can have these around for a long time now you could also probably make them a little lower in alcohol and get to it sooner session dandelion wine <sighs> you had to go there table dandelion wine small <laughs> Well, let's talk about it's mine real quick. Kids. Obviously way lighter in color. It's the exact same processes, but I think maybe I just didn't have the wherewithal to get quite as many um, dandelions as you did. But mine does not have that sweetness mead-like thing at all. Ours is very dry, like bone dry, Chardonnay kind of white winey. I almost feel like... So I don't, under, I don't know you might quite get, what happened, or maybe get, just the age. You might get more of a floral character yeah, I because feel like of, you don't have as much of a body and a sweetness. Yeah. I'm guessing you didn't use as much sugar, would be my guess, um, just because, you know, even though this one got down very low in Final Gravity, fairly low, especially if considering it was yeah. one point. 119 1119 don't hit a lot of notes <laughs> which is very high so i'm not sure so, what's going on and he doesn't have the notes on how, of what he As used always. or what the gravity was but i did it exactly like your 08 kind of recipe so it, was, it is weird that it's that much lighter but who knows but it's a different it's just a, it's another result it's a yeah. different way to get a dandelion wine yeah. and and dandelions are in themselves a bittering agent, according to sacred and herbal healing beers. So it's kind of interesting that this one to me is way more bitter. Maybe there was just a sugar balance. I mean, that's got to be part of it. Yeah. It's interesting in this book, he points out that dandelions are, like I just said, bitter, stimulates digestion. Um... Clinical trials have proven dandelion to be effective in treating pneumonia, bronchitis, and upper respiratory infections uh, as a tea. It has calming effects, almost a slight slash minimal narcotic effect, and it's got a lot of vitamins, vitamin C, zinc, vitamin A, potassium, so clearly that's different when you eat it raw. That would when be the leaves, probably? Um, you wouldn't eat the flowers, would you? You would eat the leaves, wouldn't you? I don't know. I assumed he was talking about the flower, but he hmm. could be talking about the leaves. Speaking of the leaves, a really quick chop element to this is when we were picking all these, we had this idea to like, let's do the dandelion green. So I have a couple pictures of us. We picked a bunch of dandelion greens, like from basically from the ground up to the flower, washed those off in a sink, got all the dirt off of them. We fried up a pan of really good bacon. Um, and after that was done, we moved that aside. And then we deglazed that pan with apple cider vinegar, a little bit of beer, of course, and a little bit of brown sugar. 
got that kind of to where it had basically like a saute juice in it, threw those greens in, wilted them, served them with the bacon on top, and it was an amazing springtime dish. Clearly bitter, so maybe he is talking about the greens, because yeah. it was a very bitter dish, reminiscent of like arugula or something like that. But okay. since we had also drowned it in brown sugar and apple right. cider vinegar, it had a little... Yeah a little acid to it, a little bit of sweetness to it. So that's a nice springtime thing that you can also salvage from your backyard. Well, some people eat dandelion green salad. I don't know what yeah. how they prepare it, but they just go, I don't know, they're always steeping, cooking it in bacon fat and like <laughs> adding all this sort of stuff. I think they just can eat it like, like you say, like yeah. bitter, bitter greens. Is there anything else you want to say? I mean, to me, and it's kind of what I was saying in this presentation, it was just like, try it, try more things. Um, you make a fermentable solution. You steep yeah. interesting things in it. Next thing you know, you have. I yeah. mean, these are these are like holiday gift worthy. I know that you're probably just squirreling them away, but they're in such good shape. They're amazing. I even like ours a lot. I'm coming around but, to yours. It was so different. Yeah. Then it was just just so different. But on its own and for what it is, it is a just a different floral, uh, almost bitter, different beverage. I guess what well, to your point is. By this time, you asked me how I got into it, by this time I had probably made beer, cider, and mead. And I probably was just thinking, what is the next thing I can try? And I, I gave this a shot. Now since then, I've also done a thing one time with maple syrup. Oh, yes. I did a maple syrup uh, Acer Glen? wine, which I, I believe is Acer Glen, I don't know how you, or how you pronounce it. but And that was the same thing, like what can I ferment, what can I, what can I make that might turn out in an in a enjoyable way. And then I also did a... Uh, it's, it's still in the process now, but I finally had enough bonus raspberries that I made a raspberry wine, and that's still sitting in my basement. It just goes to the point, this is kind of the country wine thing. I mean, any kind of homegrown fruit, um, or even, you know, in this case, flowers, different things like that, you know, I'm sure you can use any number of plants, like lavender and whatever, juniper, all kinds of different things to flavor different alcoholic beverages. Yeah. Um, so yeah, check out Don's website and YouTube page. He's got more minute details about this. I unfortunately don't have a recipe to share with you, only photos. Um, if you decide to make this, and I have a feeling a lot of people will now, definitely share that with us. Uh, hit us up on social media, I don't know, hashtag it Dandelion Wine, even. Maybe we can track everybody's projects through that. I would definitely check out this book, Sacred and Herbal. Healing beers. He talks about these are basically ancient and archaic and historic recipes, using everything from peppermint, mustard greens, dandelion, all the way up to psychotropic beers. Right. If you want to check this out, use the link also below the video. I'd like to uh, spread the word on this book. But until then, man, this was a really fun project. Elsa's been like, I had to like hide this from her because we only had the one bottle left, and I was like, we can't drink that till Don comes to do the video. So. Cheers to Elsa who now Today gets to, she gets to drink it. And not it. too much better or much more potent version. So cool. Let us know how things are going. Dandelion for dandelion. Yeah. Pick for pick. Chop Cheers. Chop. <laughs> pick for pick. That <laughs> gross. Like... Guitar pick. By the way, these taste better when they're on Chop and Brew coasters. Now available at chopandbrew.com. Super thick, heavy duty. Shout out to Dwit and Boxy Mouth. So, um, after, so by that time, oh, excuse me, let me get you start that again. <laughs> Dandelion wine make me feel so fine. <laughs> you keep my hands yellow all of the time. <laughs> Dandelion wine make me feel so fine. Keep my girlfriend and her grandma crunk all of the time. Mm. That was supposed to be grandma and girlfriends crunk because I don't have a girlfriend anymore. This one is going to be strong. It's 14%. Or How more. can you know that? Because I took gravity the... readings, yo. It's called science. But once, <laughs> look it up. It's called brewing. But once you rag on the secondary raisins, the thing now you, you can't track it. The thing that you, you, you're right. The thing that you don't know for Watch sure. Watch people like comment. Oh, I want to try the crispy G's the thing, calculator. <laughs> the thing that you don't know for sure is how much additional alcohol the raisins will get. But you know the minimum amount of alcohol. 
How? Because. I don't know what it is. Because of science. You take the original <laughs> gravity and you take the final gravity and then the difference. It, it, you... But once there's alcohol in it, even those numbers are skewed. Have you never brewed a batch of anything in your life? Final versus original is a different thing than final, original, final, and then treating this final as the original for a secondary because so, of the okay, look, alcohol that's present. Look, it was... Right? No, look. Am I tripping? Maybe. Dandelion wine to make me feel so <laughs> fine. Lord. Get me crunk on Sundays all of the time. <laughs> Dandelion wine make Don go blush. He go blush and drink it up in a rush. Uh. <laughs> That's fly. Don't forget the best way to keep chopping brew on the web waves is to order merchandise and to donate. <laughs> See, that's a great call to action, and now it'll be in the blooper reel. This, it was 15.9, so then it got down to 1.6. Okay. That's the percentage of alcohol. So the difference is... 14.3, so it's at it's at least 14.3%. That's the side of the hydrometer with the percent alcohol. If, if it has that on there, otherwise you can go look it up. But yes. <laughs> look it up! Well, no, there's a triple scale hydrometer that does have the... No, I know. Has, right. Yeah, totally. So this one is at least 14% with the raisins. No, I'm saying... That's why put... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what the just... hell is he shivering about? He's cold. Well, then go inside. He's you have gonna, 14 beds inside, and they're all warm. He's not going to be out here with you guys, but it's cold. Dandelion wine make Don go blush. He go blush and drink it up in a rush. Oh, <laughs> that's fly. How's that for a blue reel? Okay. <laughs>